So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Roman Renzi. Uh, he is the executive director of TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences for the Advancement of Science in Developing, developing Countries. He is based in uh, Trieste, Italy, and directs the Secretary of TWAS that administers uh, some 100 PhD fellowships and postdoctoral fellowships per year for scientists uh, from the developing world, um, plus nearly $2 million um, in research grants for individuals and research groups in developing countries. Romain also plays a key role uh, in science diplomacy, as you will hear very shortly. Um, Romain joined to us in April 2011, and before he served for four and a half years as Rwanda's Minister of Education, Science, and Technology. And prior, he, was, he served in the president's office in charge of science technology and scientific research. Um, he was at an LFA on AAAS um, Center for Science Technology and Sustainable Development um, in 2009, and also visiting professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, Romain was born in Rwanda and raised in Burundi. He received, he received his master's in physics um, and his PhD from Catholic University in Louvain in Belgium. Um, Romain was selected as, as elected as Fellow of the TWAS in 2015 and a Fellow of the African Academy of Sciences in 2012. In November 2014, he was appointed by the United Nations Secretary General as the Chair of the High Level Panel on Technology, <coughs> Bank and Science, Technology and Innovation Supporting Mechanism for the Least Developed Country. Please join me in welcome Professor Romain Romain. So it's a, a great honor for me to be invited uh, to speak uh, to this, uh, in this session. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about a view from the South, South Diplomacy in the world to world. If you start in 1972, when uh, Richard Nixon visited uh, China, out of the meeting, they could not agree on many things, but uh, they were able to agree that they are going to cooperate in science and technology. And that made a huge difference in uh, bringing out China and, and to bring to bring the scientific capacity of China to, to bring China where China is now. I don't think that China would be what it is now if they had not really worked on this possibility for relation with the U.S. in building the scientific capacity. And later on, of course, we have an agreement in 79, uh, <coughs> the U.S. And, uh, and China. And science was always at the center. Here you have two countries, one in the north and another another in the south and different cultures but also <coughs> different type of institutions but they were able to agree that cooperation with science technology is very important because the US was coming in a strong position the US could deliver something that China didn't have and they were able to build a trust and several and uh, thousands of Chinese students came to study, to study in the US. And we are all getting, getting the benefit of this uh, cooperation. Uh, China is stronger than it was at the time. Uh, China has built its scientific capacity. And China is supporting, actually, countries in the developing world. Uh, as an emerging economy, is supporting a lot in building scientific capacity for other countries in the least developed countries. Uh, already with uh, TWAS, uh, China offers uh, now around 200 scholarships for PhD and other type of collaboration. 
but not only China, but a country such as India and Brazil also benefited a lot from the from this uh, 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 cooperation. Uh, later on, uh, you could see students from China, Brazil, India, and other coming to the U.S. and that has made a huge difference. China, India, Brazil, and um, countries such as South Africa are making economies because they've been able to build their uh, scientific uh, capacity. But long before 1972, science and diplomacy had begun to reshape the co contours of North-South engagement. Uh, from Winston Churchill, when he, he said that uh, from Staten in the Baltic to Trieste in the Atlantic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Trieste was a divide between the West and the East. But from the end of the Second World War and the fall to the fall of the Berlin War, Trieste was seen as a bridge between the West and the East. And scientists from both uh, East and East could come, West and East could come and do science in Trieste. But also later, Trieste was going to be seen as a, a bridge between North and South. Two physicists, Abu Salam of Pakistan and Paul Budinich of Italy, two different cultures, a Muslim and Christian, from a Christian country, from a Muslim country, came together to build the International Center for Theoretical Physics in 1964. It means uh, eight years before the meeting between Mao and, uh, and Nixon. And later on, in 1983, Abu Salam had to establish twice the World Academy of Sciences now, called the Third World Academy of Sciences. <coughs> the Third World because you have the East, we have the West, and the other, the other guys were the third world. <coughs> Abu Salam understood that uh, it was very difficult to, to be able to help scientists from developing countries that didn't have academies. So his idea was to establish an academy that will, uh, will bring together scientists from countries that didn't really have academy or that didn't have a chance to be able to uh, to have access to science, but who are probably good scientists after they finish their PhD and they, they return back home, how do you help the, that, that scientist to build his or her own capacity? So he thought that was a very good idea, and with him and Paolo Budinich actually uh, worked on the establishment of the Third World Academy of Sciences, a team of 42 elite scientists from the North and the South met in Trieste uh, in 1983 for the foundation, the foundation meeting. And uh, Abu Salam will uh, say it, saying that uh, the Third World Academy must serve in the cause of enhancing South-South and South-North collaboration. Very important. Bringing scientists from the North and scientists from the South together, but also South-South cooperation. One can say that uh, before 2000, or say 2015 now, you could say that most, most student or who want to do PhD have to go to the North. They have to go to, to Europe, they have to go to, to the US, but now things have changed dramatically because China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, and some other countries in the South now have developed their scientific capacity in a way that we can start to have a South-to-South -South collaboration. TWAS established a South-South collaboration program where China, India, Brazil, and other countries in the South, Malaysia and other, they are giving fellowship for PhD 
to study PhD in their country. And that is reduces dramatically the brain drain. As you all know, a, a PhD degree for four years will cost around $200,000 in the US. If you calculate that in a stipend of $2,000 per month, which brings you to $24,000 per year, and if we put a tuition of $30,000, $50,000 per year, if you are lucky and you finish your PhD in three in four years, it's $200,000. But already in this program, we have more than 600 fellowships per year. So if you take 600 fellowships for PhD, times 200,000, you get the picture. How this South-South population is really, is really working. But also we have the North south collaboration because TWAS is uh, uh, hosted by uh, Italy. Italy pays, uh, is, a, is a, the main donor of the academy. We have other donors, but uh, Italy is the main donor uh, through an agreement between Italy and UNESCO. So uh, Italy provides funding for, uh, for running the, uh, the, the secretariat and the funds are managed by, by UNESCO through, through that agreement. And actually, Flavia, who spoke today, is my direct boss. So the academy went from 42 members to 1,040 1, elected fellows in 94 countries. Very important. And as I said, we run all these, all these programs. I will not describe here today. Backed by science and engineering, a nation can address challenges in agriculture, climate, health, and energy. In the realm of science, an enormous gap remains between North and South. The same gap exists in science diplomacy. The science divide between South and North keeps widening. It is wide already, but it keeps widening, with the exception of countries such as Brazil, China, and India. If you look at the scientific production of the sub saharan of the, of the African continent, <laughs> It's around 2%, according to the UNESCO 2010 report. But of that 2%, 75% of the papers, they come from South Africa and Egypt. This means all two countries have 75% of all the scientific production of the Sub-Saharan Africa. So you get the picture. Third of the developing of, of, of the world is not connected to the internet, but the least developed countries, 90% is not connected to the internet. So if you are a scientist and you live in a country where you don't have access to the connectivity, you understand, even if you are really very, very bright, it will be very difficult to be able to do research. As I said this morning, eight focus on building scientific capacity can help to reduce this divide. And that could be an opportunity for another type of discussion, what they call aid effectiveness. How can you redirect aid in a way that it can be, really, it can be uh, productive, it can really produce something. Countries as small as Rwanda or Benin, they have on their soil 50, 60, 70 ambassadors from all over the world, including the ambassador of the US, <coughs> the ambassador of France. What would be the ambassador of, of the US or France? What would they do in Rwanda or in Benin if they don't help build scientific capacity? What would they spend their day on? <coughs> because they, they spend their day there. During my time as a Minister of Education and Science, I had the opportunity to meet with several ambassadors. Normally when you are appointed as a minister, ambassadors who are interested in meeting you will come and 
and meet with you. But also, each time a new ambassador comes in, we'll uh, do a tour and visit and meet with ministers. And each time I brought to their attention of the importance of building scientific capacity. And that's, in, in most cases, I was able to get very, very good response. Because sometimes there's people don't, don't think about that. They would think that about other things, uh, think about peace and war, or preventing war, or working on things, things as peace. They, 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 they look at, uh, at diplomacy as related to peace, as preventing war. And they spend days in those kind of meetings in the region trying to, to work on things. But you hear that actually, if you have a long-term capacity building, you, you focus your aid on education and science, you link science to agriculture to health with a good strategic plan, actually, by building scientific capacity, you raise the condition, the living condition of the people in the country. And you can, in one way, in many ways, prevent war, prevent you know, things that are happening. If you read the news now, you can see from the world, uh, there are uh, political crises. If you look at this crisis, mostly they are, uh, they are related to hunger. People don't eat enough. People don't have enough to eat. On the continent of Africa, 60% of the arable land of the world is on the continent of Africa. How can you explain that? Africa doesn't have enough food. Trust and other science academies and organizations are working to bridge this north-south gap. It's a dialogue. Be able to understand. Though many scientists and policy makers in the developing world engage in international cooperation, many or most of them are not familiar with science diplomacy. Development through science technology begins with knowledge. So does science diplomacy. Many developing nations have not developed this capacity. Developed nations and emerging nations have more resources, more experience, and more expertise, and they have more power when it comes to global international discussions. On regional and global issues such as climate change, ocean health, education, such diplomacy is critical for advancing international cooperation. Our job that uh, in Copenhagen when they were discussing about the issue of climate, the representative of the US or France will come with uh, a team of 10, 20 people around him, expert, to help him to be able to make decisions. But a minister from Africa or from Nepal will come alone. Or they will just send an ambassador or somebody from the diplomatic mission that is the closest. And the guys will put a signature on the document. Because they don't have the, the scientific capacity in the ministries of foreign affairs to be able to cope with international science issues. That's something that is very important. For science diplomacy to flourish, nations must cultivate science diplomacy relationships that are balanced and fair. Build trust, respect for independence through research Partnership, cooperation to build capacity, share benefits. Such engineering organizations, including academies, can play a leading role in this, in this process. The World Academy of Science has a, a science diplomacy initiative focused in two areas, South North leadership, dialogue, and education, and training. We have been organizing several meetings in Trieste. Um, this is a meeting that we organize uh, between Central Europe and Southern Mediterranean. We, we brought 
uh, scientists and policy makers from countries around the region. And we worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Hungarian Academy of Science. And from each country, we brought a man and a woman to try to balance, otherwise we could. And we brought a scientist and a policy and a policy maker. It's an, another example. Every day, every year, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy organized an Africa Day, and this time they wanted to focus on science. And they were ministers of, of uh, no, sorry, ambassador of all the all the African African countries. And we organized a session with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And we invited uh, a scientist uh, from Africa, two scientists, one a woman, she's at the right there, and the and the man uh, second to the Minister uh, of, of Foreign Affairs. We organized courses and workshops in partnership with uh, TPS. We host IAP. IAP is the, the NATO Academy of Sciences, and uh, with them we, we we do a lot of work in uh, in uh, science diplomacy. We host IAP, the Academy Medical Panel. We host, host also the organization of women women in science. Science diplomacy cannot solve every problem. If you understand that South and North have different histories and different needs, we, we improve our chances of fully realizing the potential of science diplomacy. I am ending with uh, these four, four pictures. Uh, top, top left, I am with the Prime Minister of Grenada. That was about, uh, I think, a few weeks ago in the in, uh, in Caribbean. There was a a ministerial meeting on, on science and technology, ministers of education and, and, and science and met to discuss all that. And TWAS was involved in, in organizing uh, that meeting. Uh, TWAS for like, uh, our regional office in, uh, in Latin America and Caribbean. On the top right, it's a meeting that we're organizing, collaborating at, at, uh, by three players in 2010, that's before I, before I left. Uh, we invited you know, in, in the region, in East Africa, sometimes there are many conflicts and people talk, don't talk to each other. In particular, uh, we were able to bring the uh, delegation from Congo. So we invited a, a minister and uh, a, two professors, a man and a woman, and two students, a man and a woman, from each country. And we were able to bring some people from, from Congo. This was actually the first time that these people actually came to came to one, so it, it was a quite very, very interesting. And that we have uh, the ministers and, and from the region. I, I think three weeks ago, few weeks ago again, I visited Sesame. I was very excited when I visited Sesame and uh, because they, uh, one of my colleagues, physicists, they've been writing to me, has been writing to me about this uh, African light source. So when I visited uh, Jordan, I said I should go and see. I was really very, very impressed. And I think that Africa can do the same. Um, UNESCO can help a lot in, uh, in, uh, in this dialogue. But also, one can find a way to, lead, to reach some of the leaders in Africa to be able to do, to do support. And the top, uh, the bottom right, is a, a typical trust meeting. And this one, was you know, uh, in a, in a man, uh, yeah, in, in Mascat. So very, very interesting, we, we were able to do a meeting there. Normally we do a meeting uh, per region. So this time it was, uh, was, the, was the Arab Arab region. So we're going to do a meeting. And this year we will do the meeting in Austria. It will be the first time that we do a meeting in a, in a developed country, in a, scientific advanced country other than Italy. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, experience. Uh, the president of uh, Austria has accepted to actually to open the conference. 
uh, going to be available, and we will have a ministerial session, as usual, on, on the issue of uh, sustainable development. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you for listening.